The allegoric subplot of Act 5 is rather absurd and bizarre. It cannot possibly be understood, without a historical biographical background knowledge of Shakespeare, Marlowe, and the supposed authorship situation and conspiracy. Let's briefly listen to three sections of key scenes with significant contextual parallels to the Shakespeare Marlowe authorship plot. First, Marlowe's apparent death. Second, the Deptford plot. Third, the Stratford Monument. The protagonist of Act 5, the wild young gentleman Fowler, is manipulated by ingenious Penelope metaphorically his alter ego, or in a muse, or goddess of fidelity. Fowler. That is Marlowe, no other plausible candidate is conceivable. Has been frightened into respectability by the preposterous device of all his friends behaving as if he were dead. His environment confronts him, as a man dead to his nobler nature. Listen to a part of consecutive utterances of Fowler. I would not believe myself sick. Like I am dead, it is more than I know yet. By all circumstance, they mean me, these gentlemen know me, too. How long is it since I departed? Some mistake? Ha, ha, gentlemen. What do you think of the dead man? Coxcombs, do ye not know me? I'm alive. Do you not see me? For whom, my furious poet? Ha! Not know me? Do I walk invisible, or am I my own ghost? And you will not see me, you shall feel me, you have an imble pate, I may chance strike out some flash of wit, no. Indeed you lie, sir. Is my body at your house? Very good then I am dead, am I not? Whose funeral, you man, of Bedlam? Master worthy, gentlemen. Do you hear? Is it possible? Not know me? Not see me? I am so thin, and airy, I have slipped out of the world, it seems, and did not know on it. If I be dead, what place am I in? Where am I? This is not hell. Sure, I feel no torment, and there is too little company, no, it is not hell, and I have not lived after the rate of going to heaven yet. Beside, I met just now a usurer, that only deals upon ounces, and carries his scales at his girdle, with which he uses to weight, not men's necessities, but the plate he is to lend money upon, can this fellow come to heaven? Here a poor fellow is put in the stocks for being drunk, and the constable himself reeling home, charges others in the king's name to aid him. There's a spruce captain, newly crept out of a gentleman usher, and shuffled into a buff jerkin with gold lace, that never saw service beyond Finsbury or the artillery garden, marches waving a desperate feather in his lady's beaver. Umph! I'll to worthies before they bury me, and inform myself better what is become of me, if I find not myself there in a coffin, there's hope, I may revive again, if I be dead, I am in a world very like the other, I will get me a female spirit to converse with all, and kiss, and be merry, and imagine myself alive again. Fowler's, alias Marlowe's, complex situation with a splitted identity, being officially dead, but in an unprecedented way alive, due to a pen name of a real existing person, Shakespeare, is simply unthinkable or unimaginable and doubtless absurd and bizarre. As long as you do not recognize the autobiographic parallels between Fowler and the Marlowe, Shakespeare conspiracy, you may notice, that the author, doubtlessly, distinguishes Fowler in a highly condensed way, as a blueprint of Marlowe's concealed survival. Since I departed. I am a dead man. I walk invisible. Am I my own ghost? Dead or not? 
my body at your house. Whose funeral, you man of Bedlam? Then I am dead, am I not? Is it possible, you not see me? I have slipped out of the world. What place am I in? Where am I? Too little company. I find not myself there, in a coffin. Hope, I may revive again. If I be dead, I get me a female spirit, Penelope. Imagine myself alive again. Please, also note, that in the same monologue, Fowler contrasts himself in a highly condensed way with another person, he just met. With Shakespeare from Stratford. A usurer. Only deals upon ounces. Carries his scales at his girdle, with which he uses to weigh. Not men's necessities. He is to lend money upon. A poor fellow. Is put in the stocks for being drunk. Charges others in the king's name. A spruce captain. Crept out of a gentleman usher. Shuffled into a buff jerkin with gold lace. Never saw service beyond Finsbury. Waving a desperate feather in his lady's beaver. Consider that this analogy with Marlowe's concealed survival and with a borrowed pen name from a money lender and gentleman usher. That is Shakespeare from Stratford. If it does not yet convince you, will perhaps become even more obvious with the subsequent two further scenic examples of Act 5. Remove the hearse. Into this chamber. In your nobleness, I desire, you will interpret fairly what I am to personate. And by the story, you will find, I have some cause of passion. This is the room, I sickened in, and by report. That is the coroner's report, died in. Oomph. I have heard of spirits walking with aerial bodies, and have been wondered at by others, but I must only wonder at myself, for if they be not mad, I am come to my own burial. Certain these clothes are substantial, I owe my tailor for them, to this hour, if the devil be not my tailor, and hath furnished me with another suit, very like it. Rings his money. This is no magical noise, essential gold and silver. What do I with it, if I be dead? Here are no reckonings to be paid with it, no tavern bills, no midnight revels, with the costly tribe of amorous she sinners, now I cannot spend it, would the poor had it. By the prayers, I might hope to get out of this new pitiful purgatory, or at least know, which way, I came into it. Listen finally to Fowler's stunning monologue on his own burial, disclosing in a roundabout way the Stratford Monument conspiracy. In all this sermon I have heard little commendations of our dear brother departed. Rich men do not go to the pit hole without compliment of Christian burial. It seems, if I had lived to have made a will and bequeathed so much legacy as would purchase some preacher and eat cassock, I should have died in as good a state and assurance for my soul as the best gentleman in the parish. Had my monument in a conspicuous place of the church, where I should have been cut in a form of prayer, as if I had been called away at my devotion, and so for haste to be in heaven, went thither with my book and spectacles. Do you hear, lady, and a gentleman, is it your pleasure to see me, though not know me, and to inform a walking business, when this so much lamented brother of yours, departed out of this world? In his life, I had some relation to him, what disease died he of, pray? Who is his a yet at common law? For he was warm in the possession of lands, thank his kind father who having been in a consumption sixteen years, one day, above all the rest, having nothing else to do, died, 
that the young man might be a landlord, according to the custom of his ancestors. Can anyone doubt that this monologue deals with the true as well as with the false Shakespeare, in the context of the Stratford Monument? Is it conceivable that the author of this monologue, James Shirley, poet and playwright, was privy to the most intimate details of the Shakespeare conspiracy? Could it be, that James Shirley is not the one, encyclopedias are trying to make us believe? Do not we have to look for a more plausible explanation of the true author of this monologue written a few years after the erection of the Stratford Monument? Shouldn't one begin, to rethink the authenticity of James Shirley? John Michel was an English author and a prominent figure in the development of the Earth Mysteries movement. Over the course of his life he published over 40 books on an array of different subjects. In his book, Who Wrote Shakespeare, he finished the chapter 8, The Professional Candidate with the following sentences. It is impossible to separate Marlowe and his mysterious, often sinister associates from Shakespeare, and the circumstances, in which Shakespeare's plays were produced. Marlowe undoubtedly had a hand in Shakespeare. If he really did survive his own murder, there is no limit, to what he can be supposed to have done later. That's the crucial point. If there are no limits, of what surviving Marlowe has done later, then surely, most plausibly could, or should belong to the multiplicity of pseudonyms and pen names, similar to the other seven most prolific professional dramatists, Thomas Hayward, John Fletcher, Thomas Decker, Philip Massinger, William Shakespeare, William Rowley, and Richard Brome. Then James Shirley's prefatory poem, in the first folio of Beaumont and Fletcher, entitled Comedies and Tragedies, in 1647, all of a sudden gets a deeper meaning. Before listening to this poem, note, that it belongs to a numerous guard of names and prefatory verse makers in this volume. Very strangely, the volume contains almost nothing of Francis Beaumont's work, and the prefatory matter recognizes, that Philip Massinger, rather than Beaumont, who died in 1616, collaborated with Fletcher, who died in 1625, on plays included in this volume. The publisher mostly concentrated on the previously unpublished plays of Fletcher, most of them had been staged by the King's Men. James Shirley Address upon the printing of Mr. John Fletcher's works, discloses in a roundabout way, that many addressees of the volume, were fictitious names. Upon the printing of Master John Fletcher's works. What means this numerous guard? Or do we come, to file our names or verse? upon the tomb of Fletcher? And by boldly making known his wit, betray the nothing of our own? For if we grant it him dead, it is as true against ourselves, no wit, no poet now. Or if he be returned from his cool shade, to us, this book his resurrections made. We bleed ourselves to death, and but contrive by our own epitaphs to show him alive. But let him live and let me prophesy. As I go swan-like out, our peace is nigh. A balm unto the wounded age I sing. And nothing now is wanting but the King, James Shirley.